is an old comrade and friend. Uh, he and I date back to uh, the late 1960s in welfare rights. Uh, when I came on to welfare rights, I found him already here. Um, they got to meet the other day with Bill Pastorich came in for a hot minute and uh, told stories, mostly true. Uh, so, you know, so, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> over the years he's moved more towards the truth. Um, so uh, it was fascinating because it was all the way back to Syracuse and Fred Ross. Hagstrom and, and yeah. He didn't mention Hagstrom, but I knew you will. Um, and then uh, Mike Gallagher was here, and we talked uh, as well about home care, and he spent time off and on with ULU. And it, you know Mike, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Mike yeah. was on my staff. For the right, with fair share. Yeah. And yeah. also wage. Uh, That's, okay. Yeah, we were out with uh, Maureen uh, I guess two weeks ago, three weeks ago for dinner. So, yeah. Excellent. Well, I heard she's back in Boston, no? Yeah, she's New back York. and forth. Yeah, back and I was forth. just hearing about yeah. that. So anyway, Lee goes back a long time in this work, and then uh, he started, he was in, in welfare rights, he was active, as he's about to tell you, wage, fair share, and then ended up going to graduate school to work with Warren Hagstrom, who theoretically was one of the great uh, organizing minds, uh, at least, uh, of our generation. He was out at UCLA as a professor of social work, I think, and Lee spent some time with him. I think, uh, you know, we used to sort of make fun of Lee. He was out there learning how to organize uh, uh, crazy people, mental health people. And now it turns out that's all what we all do lots of. So, you know, it was, he was people way ahead. been crazy. So. Yeah, that's right. All right. <laughs> turns out he was ahead of his time. And we just, oh, well, we're dealing with the ladies. We're dealing with this, that, and the other. But it's all crazy people out there. Um, By the way, Ruth passed about uh, three weeks ago. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I told... Uh, story of her walking with her gun around Rutland Square yelling, Rackley, Rackley, come out. So yeah, yeah. sorry I didn't get there for the wake. Um, that was another one of the old welfare rights leaders. Anyway, for the last how many years uh, Lee's been at Boston <coughs> University? Uh, about 30-something. So. so he found a place where he could get a different perspective on the work. He did a book, which many of you uh, have seen, and Judy even has a story she can probably <coughs> tell later about uh, a Canadian story that has to do with Lee's book that we've talked about at different times. But what I, the charge I gave Lee was first, you can talk about anything you want, but secondly, uh, because of his perspective both uh, in the work and over the last 30 years uh, as a student scholar of the work, I thought he might also be useful to engage with us on where he sees organizing now, particularly in the United States or wherever he's looking. and. Uh, where he sees it going, which is obviously part of what, this is the year-end year <coughs> begin meeting for the Acorn Canada staff, uh, uh -huh. meeting down here because it's actually slightly warmer and a lot cheaper. Um, cheaper, that's hard to believe. Through that, I, I you know, uh, we, we flew round trip to New Orleans for $204. Wow. Uh, yeah, I think U.S. Air has gone out of business. I may have been the last flight. I hope we get home. <laughs> it's, but, like those uh, old tickets. Huh? it's like those old tickets we used to get. Yeah, the Liberty Fairs. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, I still have a fond place for U.S. Air in my heart. Uh, but regardless, that's sort of what Lee's going to do. He's going to start off. I'm sure he'll quickly be asking people what they have to say, and I'm just delighted he could spend time with us. Lee. Thanks. Um, well, at the risk of being too professorial or whatever. I'm, let me frame some stuff uh, and then I'll kind of meander through some of my history and give some examples of different kinds of organizing and uh, wind up talking about trends in the U.S. at least and uh, where things seem to, to be going. Um, what, what we see, and, and certainly uh, there are different ways to categorize stuff, but I, I think you can essentially look at sort of four general types, uh, arenas for organizing geographic, identity, issue-based, shared experience. Uh, and most stuff uh, falls into those, those categories. Um, geographic, you've got everything from little neighborhood block associations, the goal being simply to improve the neighborhood on up to citywide organizations like Brockton Interfaith or Worcester Interfaith organizations, to statewide 
Uh, Gallagher probably talked about uh, bass fish here yesterday or, or not. Uh, a little, yeah. Statewide organization. Or national or international like ACORN. Um, and obviously very different kinds of, kinds of goals. Uh, and I'll come back to that. Um, identity, you talk about everything from race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, uh, disability, physical disability, mental disability, and so forth. And I've had experience in each of these areas, so I'll, I'll talk about them as we go <coughs> forward. Uh, shared experience, being homeless, being a public housing resident, being unemployed, being a newcomer, a student. Uh, and some of these you could say, well, is that more identity? Is that more shared experience of whatever? There's, <laughs> there's those streams. Um, and obviously issue uh, focused on specific issues, environmental justice, transportation, police relations, housing, taxation, whatever. As, uh, as I look at it, I find it easy to kind of understand what's going on by sort of having an organizational blueprint um, that I can frame stuff with, and it's easy to remember by just saying, so who wants what from whom, because I'm grammatical, and how. Um, so the who is the constituency, the membership, uh, the leadership, the staffing, and the structure wants what, obviously the goals and objectives, from whom the target, target systems, how, strategy, funding, allies, communications, you could throw in track record if you want another, another dimension. Um, so I refer to some of that stuff and um, I think across the world is essentially two fundamental approaches to organizing collective action to bring about change. One is sort of developmental, where you're mobilizing people essentially not to <coughs> redistribute power, not to challenge relations of power, essentially to use their collective uh, capacities to bring about change in their communities and their lives. Um, much of the Peace Corps kind of work, much of the stuff that's going on in Africa would fall under developmental uh, kinds of approaches. And again, I'll come back and give examples of all these different things. The other, the other approach is social action, where you're essentially trying to get an external decision maker to do what they otherwise would not do without pressure. And you could think of a continuum of strategy from collaborative, where you've got agreement, you collaborate, where you've got a difference, <coughs> you use persuasive campaigns, you try to convince the target, where there's a fundamental clash of, of interest, you've got a contest, and you're essentially trying to coerce or force them to make a concession. So a successful persuasive campaign results in a consensus results in agreement, uh, whereas a successful social action or contest results in a concession, all right? Um, so Obama now with the fiscal cliff and so forth, you know, it's on, on the um, tax increase for, for the wealthy, everybody's saying, well, collaborate, collaborate, convince, convince. You didn't have to do that, because uh, after the first of the year, the, uh, the the bush cuts are ended and the taxes are going up anyway. So, you know, if he uh, has any brains, he'll, he'll continue to just use a contest approach there and it, it, will, it will take place. Uh, so things fall into those three kinds of uh, strategic approaches in either developmental or social, social action. Um, the bulk of my experience, and certainly the er early experience was pretty much exclusively social action, but because I'm in an academic setting now, I've had much more exposure as well to uh, community development approaches. Um, I cut my teeth on welfare rights, uh, as did Wade. I was in law school, um, I was 1A draft status, I was not particularly political. Um, it was just a pain in the ass, and I disagreed with the war. And, what uh, A meant you were going first? Say what? <coughs> I just explained what 1A meant. 
Oh, I'm sorry. So 1A <laughs> draft status uh, meant that essentially they didn't, you know, it used to be for, for uh, folks that were in school, which was mostly middle class kids, uh, they <coughs> would not, they would be deferred from draft status, so they wouldn't get draft. But as the war escalated, they needed more troops, so they began winnowing away all the, the different coverages. Um, and so I didn't particularly, I don't know exactly why the hell I went to the law school. I didn't really know what to do, and it just seemed like something to do. Um, I wasn't particularly enthralled with it, but I was doing okay. I was at uh, Boston College, and uh, so I wasn't particularly wedded to it, but I had a deferment that was handy. Um, and then they took that away, and so uh, I had several options. I could go in the National Guard, uh, like, uh, who was the, Dan Quayle? Uh, the George Bush. Did Bush do that <coughs> thing, was too? a pilot in the National Guard. Uh, I missed that. Um, I could um, go to jail. I could go to Canada. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a good choice. Uh, my wife uh, is French Canadian. Uh, a lot of family up there has a aunt that had 22, 22 kids, twenty one of whom lived. Um, wow. French Canadian Catholic family. Um, I uh, wound up. Uh, I was I was in a city, New Bedford. It's a working class town, a big fishing area down the south part of uh, Massachusetts. We had a really hostile draft board, uh, and the uh, the director of that, Mary Amral, uh, essentially, I went for draft counseling, and they said, oh, there's this thing called VISTA, which is like the Domestic Peace Corps. Uh, so I said, well, I'll go into VISTA, and it seemed like that would uh, provide a uh, deferment. I figured, well, I'll teach kids to play basketball, being as how I'm obviously a great <laughs> basketball player. Um, I wasn't bad. Uh, anyway, her position was, well, after you, after you go into service, you can come back and go into VISTA. Um, so things were not going well in New Bedford, so I was accepted into VISTA. I was supposed to go to Chicago for draft training, and so I decided to go two weeks early, uh, which enabled me to move my physical, because uh, you had to take it physical before they would draft you. So I moved it to Chicago. And of course, the training was only two or three weeks. Uh, so I, I went through the training, and then they sent me to Columbus, Ohio. And I moved the physical to Columbus, Ohio. And I was assigned to a settlement house. And um, we had various people coming in doing trainings and so forth, and uh, Blackstone Ranges from Chicago and so forth. And, it's getting caught up in, in all the uh, black freedom movement that was was going on. And this guy, Bruce Thomas, uh, came in and did a training, and I was really caught up by what he was, was talking about. And Bruce, actually, there's a Syracuse connection. Bruce was an African-American guy who had spent about half his life in and out of uh, the penitentiary, and the other half had become a, an activist in some organizing taking place in Syracuse uh, with George Wiley, who later headed up welfare rights. Uh, this guy, Warren Hagstrom, was a professor at Syracuse. Fred Ross, uh, Alinsky, a little bit, were involved in the training program. Bill Pastreich came out of that program, Rhoda Linton, a whole bunch of people. And Bruce was there. And um, when, when George Wiley, who came in second, uh, it, to become the director of core, uh, when that didn't pan out for him, he he became the head of uh, National Welfare Rights Organization. One of the first organizers he hired was Bruce Thomas uh, for Ohio, which is where welfare rights began. Uh, a woman named it was in Columbus. I met uh, Edith Doring and Paul Younger who was a, a uh, minister, uh, and the first welfare rights uh, organizing really started in Columbus, Ohio. So anyway, Bruce was there, he was the Ohio organizer, and uh, I was caught up, and he said, oh, we got this demonstration going on Tuesday, come on down. And so I, I went down there, and folks are marching around and chanting and so forth, and uh, it was really hot. Uh, it was in the summer, and uh, folks go into this church uh, 
because uh, you know it's just really oppressive out there, and a tenant's kind of dwindling on the on the line. So Bruce comes in and starts to sing, and gets everybody riled up. And so I'm thinking this is what organizers do, right? This a link here. Uh, so Bruce gets everybody up, very charismatic uh, guy, and gets everybody out, and they get busted. And as they're taking him away, <coughs> he says, here. And he gives me this little piece of paper. He says, go talk to this guy at Lazarus Department Store. It's like the biggest department store in Columbus, Ohio, and, and they'll make bail. So I did, and I organized bail, and they got out and, and so forth. And so that was my understanding of welfare rights as well. So you've got to be a, give a charismatic speech and have a decent voice and uh, mobilize folks to get arrested and fight for justice and, and whatnot. And, and that was sort of the Bruce Thomas model. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> um, so I said, well, hell, this, this makes sense. I, I, I started uh, you know, trying to knock on some doors and rally some folks in Columbus, which made the agency very uptight. And they decided I better move. Uh, so I moved up to Toledo, which worked out quite well because I moved my physical to Toledo, uh, which delayed it again. Um, and uh, I got up to Toledo, and uh, without any model or any particular direction beyond Bruce just kind of inspiring me. Uh, began knocking on doors, and I picked up the paper one day, and I saw up in Ann Arbor, 40 miles away, people had sat in and won grants for clothing, uh, school clothing grants. And it, by that time, it was uh, the fall, <coughs> and uh, so I said, "Well, that that's something we could do here." It was organized by the county; it was not statewide uh, welfare administration; it's by the county. Um, so I said. Um, you know, we got some leadership together. It seemed like a good thing. Uh, began knocking on doors, rallied people together. 600 people. Bruce came in. There was a local guy uh, from the uh, black kind of <coughs> capitalist uh, effort there called Harambe. Uh, so three floors to the welfare department, and uh, Bruce was on the I forget who was on which floor, actually. But anyway, Bruce was on one floor. Jerry Harvey was on another floor. I was on another floor. Um, we sat in all night. I used the agency van to go out and hustle food from the grocery. I mean, it was the political climate in those days. You could go to the grocery stores and get donations for black welfare moms sitting in uh, for special needs grants with, with lots of support. In the morning, they came. and. Uh, they arrested, I guess I, I must have been on a third floor or something. They, they arrested uh, Bruce on the first floor. The second floor was Harvey, and he didn't want to get arrested <coughs> or whatever, and basically said, well, I'll leave. And I was like 22 or whatever, so we left. Uh, Bruce was like incredibly pissed. Uh, gave me a lot of shit. And uh, what do I know? I'm, I'm just trying to do the right thing. So it's like I then became determined that I was going to go back and get arrested. Um, so within a week, mobilized people again. We went back, this time with only about 300 people. And we sat in and we all got arrested, uh, which actually was a fairly major decision for me to, to make because once I was out of Vista, then it was jail or Canada. I was probably leaning towards Canada by that point, having spent a little time in jail. Um, it's not a good option. Um, and uh, so anyway, um, they, um, the agency got very uptight. I, I had used the agency <coughs> then, uh, they were funded by United Way, and there were about uh, four vistas there, and uh, I had drawn the other ones in and so forth. They called us to the regional office in Chicago, and I was just pretty wild. And uh, they said, what, what are we going to do with you? And I said, I want to go back to Boston. By that time, I was getting engaged to get married. And I said, I want to go back to Boston. I want to do welfare rights organizing. Um, and I got the first interregional transfer ever in Vista uh, because some guy took pity on me. 
Um, so I came here. I forgot to say, I was actually in law, I was taking a law uh, course in poverty law at the uh, University of Toledo Law School at the time. I still think I'd go back to law school. And now I was kind of fired up, I'd be a poverty lawyer. And, uh, that was a good thing. But the arrest kind of ended my legal career. Um, and so I came back to uh, Boston and met Bill. And um, I was assigned to Worcester, Massachusetts. It's uh, the second biggest city actually in New England. It's about uh, 40 miles to the west of Boston. Um, some people call it the hole in the uh, Springfield, Lowell, Lawrence, Lynn, New Bedford, Fall River donut. Uh, it's a sleepy kind of, at that time, predominantly white uh, working class city. There was a, a growing uh, Latino population, predominantly Puerto Rican at that time. I went there, uh, <coughs> you know, there was the beginning of a Boston model of how to build an organization from scratch. I began doing that. The leadership didn't really uh, cotton to that idea. They felt threatened by the idea of me bringing in new people who might challenge their leadership. I was very confused. I thought it was all about numbers and power, and uh, I didn't quite understand that. Uh, anyway, Bill told me not to worry. Uh, and uh, he sent me to Hyannis, uh, which is down on Cape Cod, and uh, way out of the way, but th there you know, was a significant number of poor folks there. It was sort of semi-rural, some of the folks out there who had, people of color had uh, moved to the Cape to uh, work in the bogs, the Cranberry Bogs, years ago, and uh, there was a significant population there. And, uh, I guess I had arrived in Boston just before Christmas. I was in Worcester in January. By February, I was on the Cape. And by like the third week of February, I had got arrested in Hyannis again, which was quite upsetting to the Commonwealth Service Corps folks that uh, were the VISTA sponsors in Massachusetts. But uh, Bill. And that was 1969. That was. Uh, the winter of 1969, uh, Bill had, uh, you know, he had people in all these different places that were kind of running uh, interference. And basically, our welfare rights organizing staff was predominantly VISTA volunteers. Uh, Terry Shea, Tom Glynn, Barbara Bowen, Lynn Burke, it was just a whole, whole number. Um, and so it, it worked out. We actually, uh, I don't have time to tell all the stories, but there's some great, great Bill stories uh, where we totaled his car going down to organize Falmouth, the next town over on the Cape, and uh, the cops got there and said they were waiting for us. Um, but uh, I came back and basically specialized in organizing new, new um, chapters in Boston and surrounding areas. And the model, the essential model was uh, single, you know, we were a single issue or shared experience, however you want to cut that, uh, special needs grants. Welfare manual, a thousand pages or whatever, one line said the worker at her or his discretion may authorize special needs grants for uh, furniture, whatever, whatever, or religious occasions and so forth. We. Uh, had taken that, or Bill had taken that, and uh, printed it on a, a form, and um, listed all the conceivable items. Did you tell about this yesterday? Or? No, but they know the essentials, yeah. So anyway, uh, you know, you knock on the doors. It, it did not take a great deal of skill. Uh, you know, need some furniture? Um, and people would fill out the form. and. Depending on the neighborhood, we'd say, well, next Tuesday morning we're going to march or we're going to go over and, and present uh, our requests. Uh, so, you know, there was that, that spectrum. The reason it was particularly effective was that uh, 22 uh, women from Mothers for Adequate Welfare had sat in a welfare office back in 68 or 67 before I had uh, been involved there, uh, 
been arrested and that had sparked Boston's only racial rebellion and a riot. Uh, and so they were very sensitive to uh, black folks sitting in welfare offices and, and potentially uh, raising trouble. And I, I wound up being somewhat placed where I was uh, in the developments where uh, we had a lot of that leverage. So I, I was in Roxbury in uh, Mission Hill, Mission Extension, uh, Orchard Park, and so forth. And most of the leadership for the statewide organization was there. And we'd win something in those offices, set the precedent as a handle, and then replicate it out in Western Mass or, or whatever. Anyway, I won't go on too and much about- By development, you mean housing projects? Yeah, yeah. public housing projects. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had, I don't know, 55 chapters or something all across the state. And Wade came in to Springfield, and you know all that story and so forth. By the time welfare... Actually, we don't talk about that story. They've learned more in the last two days <laughs> than... Uh... Uh, welfare rights, you know, after a while, it's like all bureaucracies take a while to respond. They're slow. Uh, and by about two years, they figured out that they could just, under the guise of... Uh, fairness or whatever, they could say, well, we're going to uh, automatically give out a flat grant quarterly to all public assistance uh, folks uh, and, uh, you know, no need for, for this. And the organization had not adapted um, and <clears throat> really floundered in terms of what, what to do besides kind of this tactic of uh, going in for special needs grants. There, there were other efforts, and, and certainly wasn't solely one tactic, but there was not much diversification there. By that time, I was, <clears throat> along with a lot of people, beginning to question, you know, does this work? And, uh, you know, you, you were organizing very poor folks, and there was a tremendous backlash from working class people. Uh, I couldn't talk to anybody in my family about it. Uh, folks that were working a couple of jobs and just above welfare and were pissed off that uh, here are these folks raising hell and quadrupling the welfare budget in a year. My taxes are going up. And so, you, you know, the, the simple analysis was, well, how do we, all these folks are getting screwed. How do we get folks on the same side? We need much more of a majoritarian kind of approach. And I think a lot of people came to that conclusion at the same time. And, Wade founded ACORN, and George Wiley went off to start the Movement for Economic Justice. Bill had brought in different speakers, Olinsky and this guy Warren Hagstrom, uh, to talk to the welfare rights <coughs> staff over time. And I was really impressed by this guy Hagstrom, who by that time had left Syracuse and was teaching in social work at uh, UCLA. And he was talking about uh, much more a democratic kind of organization and something that was multi-issue and that was funded by membership dues and was much more stable and, uh, you know, a, a number of factors. And I was intrigued by that. Um, if he'd been teaching philosophy in Tennessee, I, I would have gone there. He happened to be at UCLA and, and so I uh, went out there to study with him. Uh, Bill actually went out to study with him in the doctoral program, and our lawyer, Steve Bottage, <clears throat> uh, went out there. He got a Reginald Huber Smith Fellowship, so three of us went out there to uh, essentially work with Hagstrom in L.A. Um, Bill came back after a fairly short period when he realized he'd have to write a dissertation, uh, and his wife wouldn't write it for him. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but Bill decided he didn't want to be in a doctoral program and wanted to come back and get into, into some really good organizing. And, and Steve Bartage left. I remained and I went through that UCLA program. And over the course of time, I was exposed to different kinds of organizing. My, I did a traditional field placement, which social work students do. And it was working with uh, trying to organize mental health patients that were... Uh, living in these facilities called board and care homes. Uh, these were essentially two bedroom apartments that at the time would have been renting for let's say 170 bucks. The, uh, they were privately run, they were unregulated. You would cram into that 
two-bedroom apartment, you'd cram eight people, um, give them some starchy food, a TV set, a lot of Thorazine, which is the drug of the day. No incentive for them to get out and find a job because then you lose a tenant. Uh, and they would get uh, paid $275 a piece uh, for each one. So it was fairly <coughs> lucrative. And, and um, I was trying to organize these folks on site uh, with a the manager there uh, and to essentially protest the conditions and do something. So we decided to, uh, how do you do that? Essentially do some variation of a, a union um, model in the sense that uh, what do the owners need? They need residents. Uh, what's our leverage? Well, if this facility is better than that facility, we can recommend this facility and more people will go there. So they'll have some incentive. Uh, so basically worked for the right to organize, the recognition, uh, and then you know, very basic issues like firing the weekend cook, uh, field trips, uh, better uh, opportunities to find employment and so forth. But I was working with, uh, it was all men in the place I was working. These were guys from uh, mostly World War II <coughs> and Korea, not Vietnam, uh, who'd been in the mental health system for a long time and were very much beaten down by internalized stigma and uh, learned helplessness and all the kind of stuff that social workers talk about. and. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time playing pool and playing ping pong and just moving very slowly as opposed to welfare rights, which was, you know, a flash and a dash and very quick, quick to emerge and quick to fall apart. Uh, it taught me a different way to go, which was to, to move very slowly in a very deliberate pa way and, and build relationships uh, and gradually uh, get folks to develop some consciousness to challenge people in power and stuff. So that was a good experience. Uh, my, by the time I was there, the second uh, year, I, so that would be an example of identity organizing. Uh, by the second year, I was able with Hagstrom to essentially create my own program, which meant I only did independent studies with him. And um, I did a block place. So I spent the whole, uh, I get the semesters mixed up. I guess it was the whole fall semester in a library just reading stuff and uh, the whole second semester organizing in San Pedro. Um, and essentially tr trying to implement uh, Hags some of the Hagstrom's ideas, which was multi-issue space, uh, ge geographic based uh, organizations that were funded by dues. Uh, we were talking about uh, $12 uh, a month uh, dues. This was in 1970. That was big money. It's big yeah. money. Uh, $12 a month? Yeah. I didn't even know Hagstrom was moving that direction. This it's is very much into dues. Very much into dues. Uh, and, um, you know, much more democratic leadership processes. But the same, well, the other big thing was uh, adaptation of, Hag of uh, Fred Ross's house meeting model. Right. Ross, I believe, kind of invented the house meeting, uh, and the way he did it was to, uh, when he was working with uh, migrant workers, to find a host or hostess to invite their family, extended family, friends, neighbors, and so forth. And he would write about, you know, sometimes you'd go and the house would be dark and it wouldn't happen. Other times you would go and uh, there'd be, you know, 20 people there. And actually, Cesar Chavez was in one of those meetings and supposedly disrupted it, who is this gringo, and, and so forth. But uh, ultimately, this was an organization called uh, CSO. CSO, Community Service Organization. CESA became a leader in that, and then when he left to uh, form the United Farm Workers, Ross went with him and became the organizing director. We did an adaptation which was to combine that model of house meeting with door knocking, which is what I knew how to do, uh, so you'd find a host uh, and you'd line them up. I, I had a pretty intensive model, which was I'd line up um, people to hold house meetings and ask them to invite their friends and neighbors. But then I would knock on doors to invite people that they didn't necessarily know, so combining the two. So let's we'll start the middle of the week. On a Tuesday, 
uh, let's say I didn't have a house meeting scheduled for 7.30 that night, but I would door knock between 3 o'clock and about 6 for the house meeting the, the next night. Uh, and then I'd rush back and do reminders, and then we'd hold a house meeting that night and then roll to the next one. So we would do that straight through, uh, generally Sundays as, as well, not Saturdays or Friday nights. Uh, and using slides, using uh, pictures, uh, two types of slides, people taking collective action successfully. Here's the car speeding through a dangerous intersection. Here's people protesting. Here's the workers putting up the, the st stoplight. Uh, you know, basic stuff like that. So kind of showing that collective action works. Uh, and then secondly, pictures of problems uh, in the neighborhood and you just put it up and folks would talk about it <clears throat> and you could sit back and it was very different than door knocking because uh, you could really engage people. Hey. Don't pay any attention. <laughs> <laughs> just checking in. Doing all right? All right. Excellent, Mike. Uh, it, it, it's really good because the organizer could be far less directive, and it wasn't just you trying to convince somebody to do something, but you'd have a hostess you'd, or host, you'd have different roles for folks. At the end, and I could go on and on about house meetings, but at the end, you would collect the dues uh, or a pledge for, for the dues and so forth. Um, and so I experimented with that model and so forth. I spent uh, other, other time there, uh, <clears throat> I, but when I graduated from school, I needed a paying job, and so I continued doing that work. Hagstrom had something called Institute, terrible name, Institute for Socioanalysis. Uh, and, but it was, it was really interesting because it was a school for organizers who lacked formal education. We had undocumented uh, immigrants. We had folks that were right out of prison. Uh, we had folks that just had been on the street. We had folks that had been in agencies. Um, and we, Hagstrom would give folks readings. We held sessions, uh, classroom sessions. And then they had like a placement with an experienced organizer because by this time we had stuff going on in San Pedro, South Central LA, uh, in Aliso Village. Um, and put, the, put these trainees there so that they would learn how to organize and, and, and so forth. So I, that was kind of my first experience um, teaching. I, I had done a lot of training with welfare rights training new organizers. But uh, so by the third year, I needed some paying job. And so I got a job with one of Hexham's former um, students who was um, organizing family daycare providers, women, women caring for children in their homes which at that time was sort of uh, kind of an unrecognized phenomena. And they had a grant through a little college, uh, Pacific Oaks College, and uh, you know, set up this model where these were low-income women, for the most part, women who had been on AFDC at some point in their lives. Their kids were out of the house. They were caring for other kids as a uh, way, or sometimes their own grandkids. We, uh, this was very much a developmental approach, community development uh, as opposed to social action. Uh, so it was like we set up a toy bank. They pooled their money, bought some expensive toys, and then would move them around. Uh, we got the college to provide free early childhood uh, learning uh, courses for the women. It was a certificate program in uh, early childhood development and, and so forth. We developed a newsletter. They'd share tips and recipes and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we also, um, I forgot to mention on, <clears throat> on uh, the board and care home stuff, uh, really important. Uh, out of that came a whole thing that we uh, established licensure regulations for the state of California. So there was a social action piece there. And we went to Sacramento, and we won. And we got uh, board and care homes regulate uh, as much as you could do that. Reagan was governor at that time. That's how old I am. Uh, so, but there was some regulation to this industry. Uh, 
So we uh, replicated the model with the family daycare. There was, there was no licensure, there were no standards or whatever, so we promulgated uh, licensure for uh, family daycare and we did a book on, on it and there was a research project and all of that stuff. And I started doing a little teaching at this college, Pacific Oaks College. Um, so I sort of had a little bit of appetite for that, which carried over to the academic career. And uh, so Mark Splain, Barbara Bowen, colleagues from Welfare Rights, from ACORN, uh, I assume you know Barbara's name and Mark's name, um, came out to L.A. Uh, by my third year, I was kind of looking to get back to the East Coast. My wife wanted to move back to the East Coast. And so we began talking about uh, this idea of a, a statewide, trying to preserve some of the good things of welfare rights statewide, uh, chapters, uh, member, I forgot to mention there's kind of two structural approaches. One is direct membership, where the unit of membership is an individual or a family, like ACORN. Uh, the other is the classic Alinsky organization of pre-existing organizations. I didn't create a separate little category. Some people would say there's a whole separate category for faith-based organizing, but there's this congregation-based model, which you see with IAF, the Industrial Areas Foundation, with PICO and, and so forth. Um, anyway, we wanted a, a direct membership model. We wanted to preserve the uh, essentially Boston model, uh, but now building in some of the house meeting stuff, very similar to the ACORN model. Um, and uh, had the idea of making it self-funded through membership dues, uh, more democratic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we spent probably several months just uh, drinking coffee and wine and smoking dope and talking about uh, what this would look like. And George Wiley, uh, who was at Movement for Economic Justice, uh, made that the, the first pri I don't know. What, whether he claimed ACORN or ACORN claims that, <coughs> exactly the relationship was, but he yeah. never gave you much money, right? No, we were, you know, after six months in Arkansas, the, you know, Johnny and them were so uncomfortable we were letting in all these non welfare recipients, yeah. they sort of issued an ultimatum at a three in the morning meeting in Atlanta that either we stopped enrolling non welfare recipients or went out of business. So we then voted all the groups. 12 to 1 or whatever, 12 groups said they will stay with ACORN, one said we stay with welfare rights. So, you know, I started June of 70. By December, we were gone from welfare rights and uh, down to making, you know, Delgado was with me then. Yeah, yeah. $20 a week, $32 a week, whatever we could, you know, that's how we were forced to go to a due system because that's the only money we had. Yeah. And, uh, and what was the relationship with uh, MEJ? Uh, you know, friends. I mean, yeah. when they did the Jobs with Justice campaign later in the 70s, we joined that campaign. But, uh, you know, Wiley came by and visited in, you know, 72 or 3, right before he died. And, you know, yeah. but, so we were just sort of friends and out of, you know, yeah. good luck to you. But, uh, and obviously we knew Mark and you guys were up there and yeah. this, that, and the other, but no formal. Yeah, okay. And definitely no money, or that, or we would have had a, a much deeper bond. <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't have a lot of money. I mean, I, one of our things was we would, uh, for the first couple of years, we would uh, float it around so we'd lay somebody off, uh, and then they'd collect. Uh, well, this is Barbara Bowen special here. <laughs> yeah, we'd collect unemployment until that ran out, and then we put that person back on staff and lay somebody else off. So the the state always was funding. Uh, so we did take public money, but... Uh. Well, and that model we've taken on into this century. It's a good model. It's, a good model. <laughs> it's an important Food model. stamps, we, we did a whole nine yards. Uh, but anyway, um, I want to save some time for questions. But So Fair Share was an attempt to do all those things. At its peak, it was statewide, uh, a lot of chapters and worked on local issues, it worked on statewide issues, managed to pass some statewide legislation, um, had a canvas operation, door-to-door uh, -door canvas, which I could talk about for a long time, but it <coughs> actually wound up being quite problematic in the sense that uh, raised a lot of money going door-to-door, -door, and we had a canvas, canvassing staff of probably 75 
uh, the young people in multiple locations. And they would go out every, well, five nights a week, sometimes six They all six know what canvassing is. They uh, all still know that technique. Uh, but what played best in the burbs was not where the folks trying to get hot lunches in Roxbury or Chelsea or another low-income community, was where the folks trying to lower your property taxes. And it began to evolve into a white, lower middle class homeowners organization. And our analysis was sort of like, well, we still wanted to organize poor folks. Uh, and basically, uh, we distributed some, some wealth and, and power and so forth, but we needed a broader cut. Uh, so we needed a majoritarian kind of strategy. So we got to bring in, uh, and should bring in. I mean, it wasn't have to bring in, but we wanted to bring in working people and so forth. But that coalition didn't really hold so well, and over time, it sort of uh, slipped away. Wage, Workers Association to Gain Employment, uh, was an attempt to, a project that came uh, under fair share and an attempt to organize people in a secondary labor force. Uh, unemployed people, people in low wage jobs, um, people uh, in, in those days, government training programs like CETA, the Comprehensive Employment Training Act, uh, welfare recipients under the work incentive program, and youth, youth jobs and so forth. Um, and ultimately there was a split uh, and some of us that had started fair share left and other, other stayed with fair share. We aligned with ACORN um, and I won't go through all that long history, but uh, you know, that uh, I, I sort of retired twice from full-time street organizing. The first time was uh, before I came back to direct wage, and then I did that for a while, and uh, Peter and Michael were on that staff, and, uh, and actually Peter replaced me. Um, and I wound up uh, going over and starting to teach. Well, and there was a year I was uh, a trainer for Institute for Social Justice and did a lot of training for Acorn and was doing some part time teaching. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that. Right, I'd yeah, forgotten about yeah. that. Right. Uh, quickly, while at BU, I've done uh, a, a bunch of other, other things that touch on some of these other kinds of organizing. We, for about uh, 10 years, I was involved with something called Committee for Boston Public Housing. We had a student unit organizing in housing projects in Boston. <coughs> um, not so much around social action code enforcement, this is a social work school, uh, and the money came from the housing authority. Uh, there was some sanitary code stuff, but primarily it was organizing uh, residents around uh, developing programs, after school programs for kids, nutrition programs, uh, job training programs, uh, getting vacant basement spaces rehab for meeting space and becoming child care centers and, and, and things like that. Uh, we probably ran about 25 of our students through that, a number of whom, like Steve Schnapp, who I just mentioned, that UFO came yeah. out of that effort. Yep. Uh, Jeff yep. Wilkinson, who directed Mass Senior Action after that, uh, and so forth. A lot of good people. So I was involved in that effort. I was involved in an effort uh, which uh, still continues uh, to organize uh, deinstitutionalized psychiatric patients, empower Massachusetts people, organize for wellness, empowerment, and rights. Um, and some of our graduates did that. And I still do, I am a consultant or whatever to the Massachusetts Clubhouse Coalition, which uh, organizes people in these uh, rehab facilities. Um, they mobilized, you know, 700 people up here at the State House in August. Uh, mm -hmm. They had a vigil for five weeks in, outside Deval Patrick's office this summer. Um, so they do some social action and some community development. Um, most of my direct work is uh, in, in Chelsea with the organization is the worst name because it started as a human service collaborative bringing together social service agencies. But now it's a uh, community organizing effort. Chelsea's the poorest city in Massachusetts. It's about 55% Latino, other significant immigrant populations. And the collaborative organizes around uh, immigrant rights. We have a workers center. Um, a lot of the immigrant 
worker organizing is not, some of it's out of unions like this one, but a lot of it is not. Uh, and you have these independent worker centers. Uh, I did just wrote a paper on it and did a study. There's like seven of them in Massachusetts, some serving Brazilians, some serving Latinos or Chinese and <coughs> in different parts of the, of the state doing some great stuff. Um, so it, we have CLIC, uh, the Chelsea Latino Immigrant Committee. We have CUDE, uh, Committee for United for the Defense of Education, which is Latino parents uh, organizing for better schools. Uh, we have uh, Green Space, which is environmental justice. You get one of those public health maps and Chelsea lights up like a Christmas tree because you know, we're dealing with environmental racism, environmental classism. Um, a lot of good stuff in Chelsea. The collaborative's linked with a terrific group in Boston, uh, City Life Vita Urbana, uh, which is doing some great um, organizing around foreclosures and housing, coming from very much a left perspective. Uh, very it's part of the ideal. whole right to the city movement in the United States. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, block, block evictions um, and uh, foreclosures force banks to renegotiate and allow people to buy back their house or get back into their house and renegotiate the terms and, and, and so on and so forth. And a lot of youth stuff, uh, a lot of youth organizing. Um, I did a second book called Youth Led Organizing with a colleague, Melvin Delgado, and it's uh, looking at this phenomenon of youth-led organizing, which is pretty big in the States. Uh, in Boston, you've got uh, Hyde Square Task Force and JP. You've got ACE in Roxbury. You've got Teen Empowerment, you've got, which is in a number of cities and schools. Um, in Chelsea, we've got these youth organizers. Um, and, you know, part of uh, a major, major phenomena here. Uh, quickly, some other. So anyway, I, there's a lot of stuff in Chelsea uh, that uh, I'm, you know, like on the board, but essentially there is kind of like a consultant and stuff, and we place students there, <coughs> field placements. Um, I do community work, development work with the Ethiopian community, just around suicide prevention and mental health stuff. I've done a fair amount of work with uh, NGOs, non-government organizations in the Balkans, in uh, Croatia and uh, Bosnia. Um, and there, it's like if you do, I started, I'm not so much involved the last three or four years, but right after the war, if you engaged in social action, they literally would shoot you. Uh, so there was no choice but to do community development and, and take a much, I guess there was a choice, but not a good choice. Uh, not a good choice. Not a good choice. So. Uh, the risk and rewards didn't balance. No, no not a good way to go. Um, but that, that would be an example there. So just touching on some stuff, uh, and then I'll stop. Um, Let's see what I haven't touched on. Um, While you're looking at your notes, let me have Judy tell you the story of uh, your book in Winnipeg. Okay. So I met. Now, now that pressure's on. I know. It's yeah. got to be good. How spontaneous was that? Yeah. It's all. It's all documentary. So I'm from Winnipeg, and um, I, the, this organization reached out to us in Toronto from Winnipeg, like this was like about four or five years ago, and I can't remember the name of the organization, so it was run by this guy named Tom Sims, and he was in, like in the 80s at some point, he was in uh, Minneapolis and picked up your book, Roots to Power, and read it and decided that he was going to, you know, create something similar to ACORN, this community organization. And they did um, one organizing drive, and they didn't quite understand that you need to kind of keep doing organizing drives. So they did, they did one organizing drive. The outcome was like working on an education campaigns. So they decided to be like an education organization, and um, and then they took over a credit union. So, so now they administer the credit union. They have all this money, right? And. Uh... 
Not exactly to go as a route to power, but... No, and, and <laughs> two weeks ago, I had a conversation with an Austrian organizer who wanted to talk about whether or not we could have a corn in Austria, and he was working with the Social Democratic Party there, and we're about, you know, halfway through this Skype call, and I'm in... I can't remember if this was from Ecuador, before I went to Ecuador, and we're trying to establish he'd been down to visit our office in Rome and talk about it, and I said, well, how did you come to, you know want to do something along the acorn lines. Oh, he said, uh, I read a book on community organizing. It's here with me. And he pulls up your, hey. your book, Roots to Power. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, maybe we'll get you some other books to read too. <laughs> His whole notion, he'd had five organizers and he'd worked, uh, the, the party was very happy with what he'd done and they were working in one district in Vienna and he'd managed to uh, sign up 20 people over six months with five organizers. Wow. I said, well, it's a start. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> but, it's a you know, slow process. <laughs> but it must have been on the slow He's development slow lead. Model, yeah, yeah slow it's a slow model. <laughs> he knew he was dealing with, you know, a different constituency. <laughs> None of this fast. Have to what, be you call culturally it? appropriate, you know. That's yes, <laughs> that's right. But I'm not sure they're going to rebuild the party exactly that way. But uh, uh, my, my proudest thing with the book is it, actually the first edition was banned in South Africa. I had a... Mm -hmm. uh, had a student uh, from South Africa, and he went back and uh, tried to use the book, you know, for, he went through the doctoral program afterwards, was going to use the book, and they wouldn't allow it in, so I was, I was proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> it has been translated into Serbo-Croatian and uh, a few of those things. Oh, okay. Well, we're translating the acorn model into Serbian right now. All right. We forward the link to people. I uh, the uh, group that I've worked with in Croatia is the Center for S Civil Initiatives, uh, and I can put you in touch with those folks. Good, uh, they, yeah. Well, we actually, in the smallness of the world now, we have a former Acorn organizer who was in Ottawa. Hey, how are you, Jane? Yes. Excellent. We'll just make you uh, a chair anywhere, and I'll introduce you in a minute. Um, but she was Serbian and now has decided she's going to go back and try nine months to put together Acorn Serbia. And, uh, Super. So, yeah, it's, it's a wild thing. Now we're not, you know, she all of a sudden gets over there. We had a number of conversations and then writes me once she's there. You know, I wonder how I'm going to get paid. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I said, you know, you used to canvas in Ottawa. Oh, I don't know if we can do that. <laughs> I don't know, where's Jill? I lost Jill on this. I don't think that model's going to work there. Yeah, well, she said people tried it. She just didn't think it was for her. And I thought, oh, well, you know, but Greenpeace and all them do that street canvassing yeah. everywhere on petition, so. You can try. So where do you think organizing is going in the future? Well, a few, uh, tr one trend that I haven't seen happen yet, but I'm, I'm surprised it's slow off the mark, but it just has to happen, is you're going to see more organizing around elderly issues just because of the, the demographics of it and obviously the conversation in this country now is all about entitlements mm -hmm. and, uh, and and so forth. It's interesting that uh, groups like Gray Panthers uh, peaked a long time back. We had a statewide organization here which actually a guy out of Fair Share started and a guy that went through our program and through Committee for Boston Public Housing headed up for 10 years mass senior action and it's still in existence right. but and you know one a state the first state prescription drug law for seniors uh, and did did some really good stuff but uh, there is less organizing right now around uh, elderly issues than it was maybe 15 years ago but generationally you would ha you would have to predict that that's going to happen and again with the budget so I, I see that happening I see uh, Definitely uh, a lot more work around in this country, and I know in Canada as, as well, around uh, immigrant rights. Uh, and that's at different levels. That's, that's certainly in the workplace, but also in the community. Uh, and some of it is social action, some of it's developmental. Um, some of it, I think, helps push forward community labor coalitions, which is certainly an important uh, phenomenon, growing phenomena here. Um, these worker centers are doing some really good stuff. People from uh, Central America oftentimes come in with, you know, a pretty strong ideological uh, 
analysis. And, and so that's infused a lot of the organizing here with uh, more of a left uh, perspective. Uh, so that's that's been and their really popular education coming from Salvador yeah, yeah. and um, <coughs> a very strong part of the model, which we're going to talk about in a minute here. Yeah, um, absolutely. And you know, in, in schools of social work for years now, we've been using Paulo Freire and and and, and some of that. Um, so I, I would say immigrant rights. You're going to see more environmental justice, uh, just because of uh, you know more awareness around that and the environmental movement in this country started off as very much a middle class issue but with the uh, it's it's not a new phenomenon but a growing one uh, of uh, recognition of environmental classism and, and racism uh, acorn was really the first organization of significance to get involved in electoral work in this country but now most community organizations are involved in some kind of electoral work. Uh, you know, in, in, in Chelsea, we uh, do heavy voter registration of uh, Latinos, new immigrants, uh, who are citizens at least, and, uh, and then get out the vote and uh, really have made a, a, a huge difference in terms of local, local offices and, and, and so forth. So that's, that's a... Uh, You've been in know. Chelsea a long time, you know, welfare. Yeah, I mean, uh, fair I, you share know, started, fair share started there. I lived there and then um, started getting involved again there about 20 years ago. And so uh, continue to be involved there. It's, it's a lot of good stuff happening there. Um, obviously, technology, not as a substitute, but as a uh, supplement to organizing and trying to utilize technology, uh, whether it's the social media stuff or mapping or whatever, but there's, you know, a range of uh, technological advances that uh, make it easier to do the work if folks don't get distracted into thinking that uh, signing electronic petitions and so forth really makes a difference. Um, youth-led organizing, as I mentioned before, is, is a real phenomenon. And youth uh, work, youth organizing work is really <coughs> exciting. Uh, youth tend to get right to the root causes uh, pretty directly and, uh, you know, ask, ask the hard questions and uh, really push. So there's been some great youth organizing uh, and not all of it just locally based, but uh, uh, I don't know if you're going to meet Lou Finfer at all. He's going to be here this afternoon at four. So Lou's doing a lot of congregation based stuff. Uh, one of his... Uh, component parts of uh, the Dorchester Bay uh, Community Development Corporation has something called Youth Force. And they pull together all these youth organizations every year around summer youth jobs and mobilize a couple thousand youth up at the State House pushing and so forth. So I think youth organizing will continue in a big way. Uh, environment, uh, economic justice, uh, Occupy certainly raised consciousness at least about uh, the distribution of wealth and I think without Occupy we probably wouldn't have had you know so much awareness and you know Romney's 47 percent remark or whatever at least it got it into the public discourse uh, in terms of uh, distribution of, of wealth so that's that's been I think really important and we'll continue to to see some push one would would hope there uh, for, uh, the last one I would just say is affordable housing. I'm sorry, I was going to ask you a question about the Occupy. Do you think that part of why the nation was limited on this particular movement was not just that it was a movement or that they had a tactic, but that they were young, white, middle class people? Yeah, I think, I, I think you know, the media, as is, is, we all know, is trendy and, you know, is, is flashy and didn't have to go far. They're right downtown and didn't have to really go into the neighborhoods uh, and to cover it. And uh, I'm sorry? Don't get your hands dirty. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, and, you know, folks folks could relate to it. It's, it's you know, young white kids uh, on the news talking and this could be your son or daughter or whatever and 
uh, it probably was in, in many cases. Uh, so in, in that sense, uh, and yeah, we could go on and on about Occupy, but I, I think, you know, there's some lasting benefit uh, in, in terms of uh, raising consciousness and at least changing some of the, the, uh, the discourse. Because before that, it was all the Tea Party. I mean, the Tea Party, you know, the Tea Party, some Tea Party folks were literally using Alinsky's materials. And I don't think they use Roots to Par, but... Uh, <laughs> um, it's banned in the Tea Party. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> By the way, we, we actually, I, we had a... Uh, we had a, a great action uh, in Chelsea where uh, Patrick, uh, the governor here, was going to implement this homeland security stuff, and basically it's a lot of racial profiling. And so uh, Gladys and some of Gladys Vega, the director at uh, the Collaborative, and uh, folks from Centro Presente mobilized some folks, sat in the governor's or outside the governor's office, and forced him to do public hearings. And he agreed, and the biggest hearing was in Chelsea, and mobilized about 500 people. And as a result, uh, Patrick backed off. Um, but coming to that, and we got the word early on was that uh, Tea Party was bringing a busload of folks to Chelsea of all places, not Tea Party ground, uh, but it was a public hearing, and so folks got there early and actually filled all the seats and people were lined up on each side so the auditoriums and the Tea Party came in and uh, it was like really weak and there was a great coalition and they're not just residents, there were lawyers and just all kinds of uh, diverse people speaking against this uh, policy. So Tea Party left um, after being shouted down and so forth. They dropped a dime and we wound up getting audited by the IRS, which I think about 2% of nonprofits in this country get audited by the IRS. And, it, you know, we, we pass, but it, it, what a pain in the ass. It, it's like it ties you up for a month. Uh, and we're a small organization with limited resources and so forth. And uh, they were just able to drop a dime on us and uh, force us uh, to open up all the books and be not terribly diverted, but you know, certainly to tie up a lot of staff time. Uh, so Tea Party, Tea Party seems to have uh, crested. I would say. You know, the only there were only three cities when when my book came out where the Tea Party actually did demonstrations and actions on yeah. me talking about the book. Two of them were in Massachusetts. Springfield. So. Springfield. Yeah. Yeah, at Springfield College and at Amherst at the UMass oh, Labor Center. Too. Yeah, wow. block the street. I mean, that was sort of the big thing they had was at Springfield College. They, yeah, uh, big, I big heard press. about that one. Not happy, and then Memphis. But you know, they all this place just swallowed them up in Memphis, and they all got what to talk. Why in the world? I don't count that one. You know, I'm talking about demonstrations. But you know, one single soldier is hardly a war. But uh, so yeah, fascinating. Yeah. So uh, Tea Party is definitely over. I, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the whole thing around uh, housing, affordable housing, blocking foreclosures, uh, there's a lot of energy in, in the U.S. now for that as Up well. Itself. So I think, well, you have five more minutes for questions or... Who's got any other questions? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess I could ask... Uh... <laughs> Well, what kind of challenges do you see for organizing in the future in the next 10, 15, 20 years? Is it going to become more difficult? Is it become easier? Are people going to be... Look, my impression is that people are just getting more and more pissed off. Therefore, it'll be easier to sort of get them, you know, on side and organize. But is there, are, there, are there going to be other pressures that are actually going to make it more difficult to, to get those people to become a part of a movement? Yeah, I, I think one critical issue is always is, you know, how do you pay for it? It's like right. a woman going to Serbia. It, it's like, who's going to pay for it? How are you going to raise the funds for it? Uh, you know, dues continues to be a big challenge. There's, there's problems with any source of, of funding. Um, you know, generationally, our generation came out and it was sort of like, well, you can take four or five years off and then 
people said, well, I'll go back to law school or do something else afterwards. But there was this sense, I see, you know, the young students coming out. We don't turn out organizers at BU School of Social Work. It's a social work school. They leave their $40,000 in debt. Um, they ain't going out to knock on doors for, you know, 30000 a year or whatever. That, um, so, or less. Well, I understand that. <laughs> I don't they want to come go. to Canada, <laughs> or they can, you know, work for a corner national and, you know, live off the land. I didn't want to go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Eat what they kill. So I think funding is is huge. I think uh, media. It's like, you know, in the days of fair share, we would do an action, and you'd turn on, you rush back to watch the six o'clock news, and we'd be the number one story. We'd be the number one story, and in the Boston Globe and so forth would, would have reporters there and cameras and so forth. Uh, now there is no coverage, no coverage. Uh, well, in New things, Orleans, they don't even have a paper. Well, that'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> but we got a, we've got a paper. I mean, you know, I was talking about 700 people up uh, at the State House rallying uh, on the mental health budget. It's like it never happened. It's a tree falling in the forest. Uh, the vigil for five weeks and nobody <coughs> not one story in the major newspaper to kind of do an interview, you know, what, what's going on here and so forth. So news coverage, which, you know, if you're not able, you look at what your leverage and where does your power come from and the extent, you know, for community groups, you don't have the ability to easily strike or to, to interrupt uh, profits so, so easily. A lot of it comes from... Uh, third parties, winning over third parties and putting pressure on elected officials and, and so on. So I, I think the difficulty in getting coverage uh, is, is another, another challenge. Uh, finding staffing is, is a challenge. Finding money is a challenge. Uh, tactically, I think oppositional groups are much more sophisticated. Well, this is how we handle sit-ins, this is how we handle that. So you're constantly trying to think of new tactics that uh, essentially go, in Alinsky's words, outside the experience of the opposition, but stay within the experience of your constituency. So there are tactical challenges. Um, you know, one, a much longer discussion is just flows from what I was just talking about, identity organizing and issue organizing, you've got all these silos now, and one of the reasons there's this huge explosion of identity organizing is because the geographic organizations didn't focus on that. So if, if somebody wanted to deal with their disability, and there were other projects I could have talked about, like the Ride Advocacy Project of physically disabled people, uh, you can't do that within the structure of a fair share or an ACORN so easily you need a separate organization. And at one level you say, well, that's great. There's probably more organizing going on in the U.S. right now than at any time I've been aware of. But it's very dispersed and it's totally uncoordinated for the most part. Um, the big networks still are not really, PICO is beginning to start talking about coordinated national campaigns, but nothing approaching ACORN. Uh, you've, you've just got these Regional efforts at best, but predominantly citywide or localized. How do you, the, you know, the issues all are, are national or international, uh, and you need to, you need to have power at, at the level at which you want to change policy, and uh, that calls for international organizing, national organizing. Not a hell of a lot of that going on. John, you might want to share your disability campaign for a minute with Lee uh, out of Vancouver. Sure. Um, so and then we'll. we'll Kind of coming from our members, a lot of maybe it's just in Canada, but they, they got a, there's a lot of folks on disability. I think it's easier to get on disability benefits than it is in, in, the Ameri in America. So, anyways, a bunch of our members, probably around a third of the people who come into our tax site, and the free income tax site, they come in, we sign them up, um, to, uh, are on disability. Slowly, um, they've um, uh, developed a fairly aggressive campaign to just try and raise the rates what we're saying, so they're getting poverty, it's 20, I think it's 25% of the, or 40% of the poverty rate, that's ridiculously low, the amount of money they get. Mm. Um, anyway, so we've been pushing for that every check day, we've been going, the members have been going down, Scott's been leading this up on the staff side to, to go down on check days to um, the 
Welfare Disability Office. Um, Wade had Wade had a good we had a talk with Wade, and he was talking about how welfare rights would. Um, you First know, time I got to talk about minimum standard campaigns and. Yeah. Decades, and I stumbled right into uh, their disability campaign. So we're trying to uh, find a handle um, to get the um, get it up, or find a, something that we can get benefits for our members. The one thing we've been finding that there might be something is this: a lot of our members um, are on this the secondary tier of disability benefits people with multiple barriers. They go they get six hundred bucks a month instead of nine hundred bucks a month. And it's normally we're finding like if you can get on purple multiple, multiple barriers means that you can't find work because you're disabled. Well I don't we don't I don't understand the difference between that and you're disabled people <laughs> better. Anyway, so we've been finding it's a just a question of people not find getting the right doctor to fill out the right forms and stuff like that. So that's something, but we looked through, we were looking for specialists. I felt like they went through, like they learned the lessons from uh, from you guys. And yeah. uh, they definitely took all the, and also there's stuff going out from OCAP in Ontario. I'm just traveling the world looking for special needs benefits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, we were, I, would, I looked through that and there wasn't really stuff. There was stuff like if you have like, um, you know, some horrible disease you can get this little thing. Yeah. But you need to bring in your doctor's note and you need yeah. to have this horrible disease. And, you know, um, but 